Hi, this is Dr. Alan Branch. I'm the professor of Christian ethics at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. And this is my second video in a little series about the morality of contraception from a Christian perspective. And in this second video, I'm going to focus particularly on the oral contraceptive pill and the question about whether or not it causes an abortion, which is something of a real moral debate among sincere Bible-believing Christians with an earnest desire to do the Lord's will. So let's start with a bit about the hormonal, con uh, the or oral contraceptive pill itself and just a little background on it. So first of all, you need to know, yes, originally when the pill was developed back in the 50s, indeed, Margaret Sanger was a driving force. She very much wanted uh, some sort of oral contraceptive. John Rock was actually the driving physician who helped develop this pill. He himself was a very devout Catholic, taught at Harvard, and uh, there, the initial trials were done in Puerto Rico. There's questions of informed consent, the degree to which the uh, trial participants actually understood informed consent. I'm not getting into that debate. I'm just alerting you of it. But what is the OCP? first came out in 1960 on the market after some trials in uh, in Puerto Rico. So there's basically two types of OCP uh, pills, oral contraceptive pills, two big categories. Combined oral contraceptives, which will combine estrogens and progestins, and then progestin-only pills, which omit the estrogen. Since I'm not an OBGYN, you would need to talk to your own OBGYN or family physician about which of these is better for someone's particular situation. But the vast majority of pills, as I understand it used today, are in fact combined oral contraceptives. We talked in the last video about progesterone or progesterone implants. These are something like Nexplanon, which is a match size implant placed under a lady's left bicep. It is a long lasting uh, reversible contraceptive, can be left in for up to three years and apparently is very effective at suppressing ovulation. You see some of the other forms there. I'm not gonna talk about these so much. We will focus on these first three. So again, this is the progesterone implant. It can, it's amazing, can be left in place for three years. And it's also called reversible because if this is removed, all other things being equal, assuming there's no problems with infertility, the, the couple, the husband and wife, uh, can, can hopefully get pregnant if that's what their, their desire is. So again, I've, uh, for those of you taking my class, the term long-acting reversible contraceptives is testable. This is the second time I'm mentioning it. So there are hormonal IUDs, copper-only IUDs, and then progesterone implants. So certain, and I would also add that certain aspects of the Affordable Care Act, or the slang term Obamacare, that actually favor these long-acting reversible contraceptives. So uh, they are becoming more popular and more people are using them. All right, now to the OCP. How does the OCP work? Well, the women receive a pack of 28 pills. 21 of them are active and seven are placebos. They take the placebos to take, uh, keep them on a particular schedule. And its first role is to inhibit ovulation. That's the main role of the oral contraceptive pill. If the ovary doesn't release an egg, uh, the, the wife can't get pregnant. Then secondly is thickening the cervical mucus. That makes it more difficult for the sperm to, uh, to, to get inside the uterus and make their way up to the fallopian tube. And of course, here's the debated point. This is what people debate about. Does it have an abortifacient effect? Many Christians have debated this question very seriously. And some argue that the OCP creates a hostile endometrium and thus it prevents implantation. Keep in mind, conception, uh, excuse me, uh, ovulation, conception, and implantation are three separate events. So uh, ovulation and conception take place on the far end of the fallopian tube. Conception occurs, it takes six to nine days for the uh, tiny human life to multiply, divide, reach blastocyst stage, enter the uterus, and then implant in the uterus. So the suggestion is that the OCP has a third effect so that if somehow ovulation does occur, and sometimes it does, sometimes there's breakthrough ovulation even when a mother is taking a pill and the baby uh, uh, is conceived, well, many argue, some argue, that the OCP then has another effect. It prevents implantation. 
if this is true, it raises sanctity of life concerns. So I'm speaking as a conservative Christian who believes in the sanctity of human life from conception to natural death. So all I'm asking at this point right now is to understand the moral debate and keep in mind that if this is a human life, and I believe it is at conception, then if some device, whatever it is, whether it's hormonal or mechanical or whatever, some device prevented implantation, then that would uh, have an abortifacient effect, and if someone committed to the sanctity of life, I would be opposed to such a thing. Well, the question is about this third method. Is it, is it actually a, a method? I will tell you that the, the warning labels discuss possibly changing the lining of uterus, so let's move forward and talk about this to a degree. Um, again, this is just shows you the uh, block, it, how it changes the cervical mu mucus and perhaps blocks, uh, impedes the ascent of the sperm into the, uh, to the uterus. And again, keep in mind there's basically two big categories, combined oral contraceptives and progestin-only pills. And then they come in all these different forms, monophasic, biphasic, triphasic, you need your OBGYN to helpfully uh, explain those to, to you. Hopefully she can get you squared away on that. So health risk. Uh, there's this big debate about the health risk associated with the, the OCP. Uh, common ones are nausea, weight gain, breakthrough bleeding between menstrual periods. And I just want to say that we all understand someone taking using either a progestin implant or the oral contraceptive pill, these offer absolutely zero protection against a sexually transmitted infection. Some other ones that, that get debated, health, heart problems, carbohydrate intolerance, breast cancer, does it cause breast cancer? That's a big debate. Health dangers, here's what I would say. If you look at the data, all the sort of dangers you're looking at here are usually exacerbated by other things, other variables at work in the woman's life. So it's not, it doesn't appear to be just the OCP itself that causes these things, but there's something else going on in the diet. Bad habits like smoking. Someone smokes and then takes the OCP. Apparently there may be some slight increase for risk for, um, for breast cancer and these things associated with, with smoking anyway. So let's just make sure that we keep these things in mind. Um, if you will, uh, if you'll just keep in mind that these, all these variables are affected by contributing variables like smoking or diet and that sort of thing. Keep in mind as we talk about these things. Now, the OCP abortifacient debate. Now, what is, what is this third mechanism? Does the OCP actually prevent a baby from implanting. Well, the person most who has most famously brought this issue to the attention of evangelical Christians is a brother in the Lord named Randy Alcorn. He's very pro-life. He's paid a high price for standing for the sanctity of human life. And he popularized this theory in his 1997 book, Does the Birth Control Pill Cause Abortions?, which has gone through several editions now. And it's uh, been read by quite a few Christians. And he's a brother in the Lord. So uh, I say that I, I'm going to disagree with with some of it, some of his argumentation in just a moment, but I want to stress that I do consider him a sincere brother in the Lord. So basically, it's called the hot. We might call it the heist, hostile endometrium theory. It works something like this: first of all, claims that the OCP frequently fails to inhibit ovulation. I haven't looked at the latest edition of Randy Alcorn's book, but I know at one point he's claiming 10 to 30 percent of the time it fails to inhibit ovulation. If you're a student in one of my classes, I want you to uh, notice something here. Sometimes my students get confused and on an exam they'll tell me, well, the OCP fails to inhibit conception 10 to 30 percent of the time. No, that's different. Remember, ovulation and conception are two separate events. Just because a woman ovulates doesn't mean she's going to conceive, but ovulation is necessary for conception to happen. What he's claiming is that it fails to prevent inhibit ovulation 10 to 30 percent of the time. If that's the case, then it's certainly more likely for a woman to get pregnant. And there again, since it frequently fails to inhibit ovulation, conception is possible. So he, then third, here's the point. If conception occurs, he's going to argue that it creates this hostile endometrium. The endometrial lining doesn't thicken up the way it should, and therefore the, the blastocyst cannot implant into the endometrium, into the uterus, 
uterine lining. If that's the case, it has an abortifacient effect, and he's going to claim things like, and he's right about this, that the physician's desk reference supports his argument for COCs and POPs, and uh, as well as the, uh, the warning label linings and this sort of thing. So if this is true, if you're a pro-life Christian committed to the sanctity of, hu sanctity of human life from conception to natural death, then it would logically follow that you don't want to use something that inhibits or excuse me inhibits implantation or because it would be considered an abortifacient well some christians disagree with alcorn why do they and these are pro-life christians so why do and i want to be very clear people who share his commitment to the sanctity of human life from conception and natural death reject this argument and the question is why well there's about seven different reasons why and let me try to share them with you the first and most obvious objection to this theory is the existence of what we, we sometimes humorously, humorously call pill babies. That is, people who are, are alive, who were conceived when their parents were using the oral contraceptive pill. And so there's lots of pill babies out there. My guess is someone watching this video either has had a pill baby or you yourself are a pill baby. Well. In these cases, the OCP certainly did not have an abortifacient effect. So at the very outset, I, I believe even someone like Randy Alcorn would have to agree that if this mechanism which he's proposing here works, then it, it doesn't even work all the time based from his perspective. So uh, it, if this is true, it's the first thing we can say is it's certainly not true all the time. So why else would people reject the... Uh, the hostile endometrium theory. Well, let's be clear, it is a theory. No one has observed the abortifacient action in progress, and that doesn't mean it's not true, but I am. It, it does mean that when we're evaluating this hypothesis, it would be virtually impossible to do in any clinical setting because it would require uh, a small, tiny camera inserted into the, the mother and then watching, videoing, the, if you will, the OCP failing to work, monitoring that she's on the pill and then it failed to work, ovulation occurs and here comes the sperm and then videoing the whole thing down and say, aha, it, it did not implant. It would be really difficult to observe. Doesn't mean it's not true, it just does mean it would be difficult to prove. Um, failed, and here's the third uh, reason which uh, is compelling for many people. And that is failed implantations are common in women not using any contraception. It's very common in the world that tiny human lives don't implant for reasons we don't understand. If, if you've struggled with infertility, you know this frustration and it, it can be maddening. But because that's true, it's quite difficult to, to prove that the OCP causes any particular failed implantation. So if, if a woman's using the OCP and, and it missed implantation occurs, is this because of the OCP? Or is this just something that would have happened in life anyway because these missed implantations are so common? Fourth, uh, there is significant data that indicates the use of the OCP prior to pregnancy does not contribute to a higher rate of miscarriage. So listen carefully to this argument and don't I want to make sure you understand what we're saying. The data out there is this, a husband and wife using the OCP, they decide that they want to stop and, and hopefully get pregnant and have a baby, enjoy a child. So they, they stop using the OCP. There's no data that that group of people, people who use the OCP and have stopped, there's no data they have a higher rate of miscarriage. Now again, this Randy Alcor is talking about basically miscarriage and missed implantation, if you will, while, while using the, OC, but the OCP. But this at least informs our, our thinking about this. It's not conclusive, but it informs. So the use of the OCP prior to pregnancy is not associated with a statistically significant increase of miscarriage. What that means is prior to trying to get pregnant, I should say there, so a couple that stops. Even when the use of the OCP is stopped immediately prior to getting pregnant. So, fifth, many well-credentialed researchers reject the theory, and these are pro-life people, people that share Randy Alcorn's uh, feelings about conception. Uh, from uh, sanctity of human life from conception. Sometimes, uh, sometimes people who argue the hostile endometrium theory conflate data concerning 
progestin-only pills and the combined uh, oral contraceptives, which have estrogen and progestin. And the reason that's important is the data seems to be more concerning about POPs as opposed to COCs, and sometimes people making these arguments conflate the two, and they will take data about progestin-only appeals and apply it to combine oral contraceptives. So finally, and for me, this is, uh, in the last year or so, this is something I've really thought about, and it's, uh, it, it, it has a, a lot of persuasion to me. And here it is. When ovulation occurs, and so women have, do ovulate on, on the OCP from time to time, the corpus luteum is still left behind. That little follicle turns into, on the ovary, turns into the corpus luteum. And it is the corpus luteum which sends the hormonal messages needed to thicken the endometrial lining. What that means is that if a woman ovulates, the corpus luteum is left behind, and then that corpus luteum is going to send the hormonal messages to the endometrium saying, hey, get ready, a baby's coming. Remember, six to nine days. For me, this seems to explain why some people get pregnant using the OCP, because if this didn't happen, ovulation, uh, implantation couldn't occur. And so this just gives you a diagram of, of what's going on with uh, the corpus luteum and what that, what that looks like on the ovary. It's showing you the progression. And then as the woman's cycle proceeds, if she uh, doesn't get pregnant or, what, or whatnot, then it, it, it degenerates and it just goes away. So what are the different moral stances some Christians have taken on the issue? Again, some, as Randy Alcorn says, it's an abortifacient, don't use it. Some say if there's any doubt, reject it. I'm a Southern Baptist. Some of my fellow ethicists at other seminaries take this stance. Some say it's a matter of conscience. Scott Ray, uh, who is a fine evangelical Christian uh, influential ethicist, says it's a matter of conscience. It's up to the individual conscience. And then others say the COC OCPs are not abortifacients. I fall closest to this right down here. Um, so what I would just say is I, I've not been convinced by the OCPs and the border patient debate uh, argument. And I, uh, for the reasons that I've given, I think they're compelling when taken as a whole. The question is then why do these uh, companies give these warnings? Uh, again, they have to give all sorts of warnings when they're looking out for lawsuits. Um, there are lots of things that increase the risk of a missed implantation or a miscarriage. Uh, I'm not trying to be lighthearted about something that's very serious and deeply felt by people who can't get pregnant and would like to, but there are all sorts of things related to diet and, and exercise and lifestyle that can affect a missed implantation, some of them more with higher risk levels than, than we might think. But the point being here, the these companies have to alert to every possibility. Um, I'm just not convinced that it has uh, this effect. So I would just say this uh, as well about the progestin implants and the abortion debate. It, there seems to me at least the possibility there's stronger evidence that these progestin implants may cause a hostile endometrium. But a sister in Christ who is a pro-life Christian from Australia, and she is a physician, Megan Breast, she says that they are so effective at suppressing ovulation that yes, hypothetically, they affect the endometrium, but they're so effective at a, a suppressing ovulation that it would never matter because it's just not going to happen. And that's, uh, you'd have to read her, her work to see more of that. So, um, and again, she's a pro-life Christian with whom I usually agree. So here's my conclusion. As of this writing, uh, my opinion is the evidence concerning a supposed abortifacient effect for the combined oral contraceptive is inconclusive, in my opinion, rather weak. I have greater concerns about the progestin-only pills. Here's what the Christian Medical and Dental Association says, a conservative pro-life group. While there are data about the OCP that cause concern, our current scientific knowledge does not establish a definitive causal link between routine use of hormonal birth control and abortion. Then they give this qualifying phrase, however, neither are there data to deny a post-conceptional effect, which looks like, I'm just, as I've been part of developing statements and opinions before on, on other issues outside of of this, uh, it looks like uh, they're trying to acknowledge a, a minority group that disagrees. Bill Coutrere, who is a physician, he was an OBGYN, who taught at Southern Seminary, one of our fellow Southern Baptist seminaries in Louisville, Kentucky, a, a pro-life Christian, a, a Christian gentleman of the first rate. He died a few years back. Uh, we lost him tragically. But this is what he said about the oral contraceptive pill. 
late in his life. He said, in my opinion, the evidence is interesting but not convincing that Christians should avoid combined oral contraceptives. I still prescribe them, but I explain to patients what we do and don't know. Based on current research, I'm inclined to avoid the progestin-only pill. Uh, he says, my opinion is based on the fact that POPs have a higher, have considerably higher breakthrough ovulation rate than COCs. That means that it's more likely that you ovulate on that. So those are some of my thoughts about this whole debate about the com- does the OCP cause a, uh, an abortion. And I, I, I favor Dr. Couture's opinion here, and I hope this has been helpful for you as you make moral decisions concerning the use of oral contraceptives.